Road rage. Most of us who drive have experienced some form of it, whether it be annoyance at somebody who cut us off, or even flipping someone off behind you for riding your tail. But as it happens far too often, some people take road rage way too far and people's lives have been lost. Now, for this case, that is arguably what ultimately ended the life of Kenneth Herring. However, others say that Kenneth was the aggressor and that he was killed in self-defense. No matter how you look at this case, it is such a tragic one. So, with that being said, let's get into it. 62-year-old Kenneth Hearing was described by his family as playful and a jokester. He had five siblings, all of which he seemed very close to. He also had two children as well as six grandchildren, all who absolutely loved him. His wife described him as a hard-working man, a good grandfather, a good husband, and overall, a good, genuine person. By the evening of May 7th, 2019, Kenneth was driving his Dodge Dakota pickup truck towards an intersection on Clark Howell Highway near I-285 in Atlanta, Georgia, when he actually ran through a red light. I will discuss more into why this could have happened in just a few minutes. This caused Kenneth to crash into the trailer of a semi-truck that was on the other side of the intersection. So he was coming this way, they were coming this way, and he crashed into the trailer of a semi-truck. This was described as a minor accident and nobody was injured. There wasn't a ton of damage to the semi-truck, but Kenneth's car was pretty messed up. There was stuff everywhere, debris, the bottom of the car was leaking, so even though it was a minor accident, there was some damage done and the car was in no condition to be driven. This incident was witnessed by a few people who stayed on the scene to help out. One was a correctional officer named Terry Robinson and another was a 21-year-old young woman named Hannah Payne. Both Terry and Hannah call 911 to report what happened as the two of them, as well as the truck driver and Kenneth, all pulled over to the side of the road and out of traffic as they waited for help to arrive. According to later reports, this day happened to be a really bad day for traffic in general. The I-285 was closed down at some of the exits, there was another accident on a nearby road that was causing traffic, and now there was this accident with a semi-truck blocking traffic. So, it took police officers quite a while to get to the scene of the crash. While they waited, Hannah got out of the car and went to talk to Terry, the corrections officer, as well as the truck driver to see if they were okay and to sort of confirm that Kenneth was the one at fault. However, when the corrections officer, Terry, went to check on Kenneth, Kenneth was acting confused, out of it, and didn't know what was going on. He was saying things like, who hit me, what happened, what's going on, and things like that. According to Hannah, she went up to Kenneth and said that he was actually the one who ran a red light. Then he got out of his car and was stumbling around, still acting confused, asking who hit him. According to Hannah, he looked drunk or under the influence of some sort of drugs. Terry also noticed that Kenneth's eyes looked red-orange and again he was disoriented, which told Hannah that he was under the influence. But to Terry, he said that he thought Kenneth was experiencing some sort of medical event. According to later reports, Terry worked as a corrections officer in the medical unit in the prison, so he had some experience with what these kind of medical events looked like. So, he didn't necessarily think that Kenneth was drunk or under the influence. Rather, he thought that maybe Kenneth was suffering from diabetic shock and that resulted in Kenneth's state of mind being altered. He did see some needles in Kenneth's car, which could confirm that he took insulin for a diabetes issues. So, that sort of confirmed to him that this could have been the cause of the crash. Just for those of you who do not know, diabetic shock or severe hypoglycemia can be very serious. Symptoms include feeling weak or faint, profuse sweating, drowsiness and confusion, and sudden loss of consciousness. It is a medical emergency and absolutely can cause somebody to faint or pass out behind the wheel. As everybody continued to wait, according to Terry, everything was really calm for the first few minutes. Terry was trying to keep everybody separated and everything calm when he realized that Kenneth actually went back in his car and started revving his engine. 
he looked like he was about to drive off. At this point, they had been waiting for about 20 minutes for police to arrive, and still nobody was on site. So Terry called 911 again, explaining their situation again. He explained that there was something wrong with Kenneth, that they were worried that Kenneth was going to leave the scene, and asked that an ambulance be sent. On the 911 call, you can hear Terry explaining that Kenneth's car is not in good working condition, it should not be driven, but Kenneth was behind the wheel and was about to drive it anyways. We had a call earlier, and it's been over like 20 minutes now. The reason why I'm asking that because the, the driver who caused the accident, it, it, I think he's on Terry. Uh, something's going on with him. And so the thing about it, we're trying to tell him to uh, turn his vehicle off in the smoke and he's not following the man. So that's why I'm asking to see what it does. And he's moving his vehicle. He's going to drive off, man. He's driving off. He's driving off. Take a picture of the driver. Like, take a picture. Quick, 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 quick. Quick. He's driving off. At the same time that Terry called, Hannah also called the police again, explaining that she was worried because she believed that Kenneth was drunk and was about to leave the scene of a crash. And just as they suspected, Kenneth got in his car and drove away. At first, Hannah thought that maybe Terry or the semi-truck driver got Kenneth's info down, but she realized that nobody had. According to Hannah, Terry told her to go get that tag info. So, as Kenneth drove away, Hannah was still on the phone with 911, and they too asked if she got the tag info. She said that she didn't have the info, so Hannah hopped into her Jeep and started following Kenneth to get that license plate number. However, as she was talking to the dispatcher, she said, I'm catching up to him. And the dispatcher said, we actually don't want you to chase him, we want you to be safe. They did ask for the tag info, but they said if she had to follow him to get it, that they would just take care of it. They told her to stop following him, but she continued following him anyways. Once she caught up, she was able to tell the dispatcher the license plate info, and once again, the dispatcher told Hannah to go back to the original scene of the crash, saying that they are sending officers now. Now, to pause, I want to say that initially, Hannah said that she thought Terry was actually a police officer because all he did at that time was flash his badge at her. She didn't know that he was a corrections officer who worked at a prison and was not the type of officer who makes arrests and pulls people over and deals with things like this on a daily basis. She said that she thought Terry was a cop. He told her to get his license plate info, so she thought that she was supposed to go chase him down and get that info because a cop was telling her to do so. In addition to that, she also told the dispatcher that there was already a cop on the scene, so things were kind of figuring themselves out, so she wanted to make sure that she got the information. She expressed to the dispatcher that Kenneth was drunk. She was not drunk, so she was going to follow him regardless to prevent him from causing another accident. She also wanted to make sure that she could get his info to make sure that he would be held accountable for the accident that he caused. After that, Kenneth reached a turning lane at another intersection about a mile away from the original crash site, so Hannah was actually able to catch up to Kenneth and then drive around him and block him in with her car. On that 911 call, we can hear Hannah getting out of her car and confront Kenneth in his car. According to later statements, they were at a super busy and loud intersection, so Hannah said that as she was walking up to Kenneth, he was yelling at her, but she couldn't hear him initially. But as she approached his window, she heard him yell, who the F are you? In the background of all the commotion, witnesses heard Hannah screaming at Kenneth to get the F out of his car repeatedly. She said that she told Kenneth to get out of the car and stop driving, that he caused an accident, and that he needed to get out of the car. As she was standing at his window, things started to get out of hand. She said that as she approached his window, Kenneth knocked the phone out of her hand and then reached out of the window and grabbed her wrists and her shirt, pulling them towards him and ripping her shirt in the process. Then she said that he smashed the gas pedal and started dragging her, which only lasted a brief moment until he crashed them into Hannah's car, which again was parked right in front to block him in. Then he said that she thought she saw Kenneth grabbing around in his car, 
So she told Kenneth that she had a gun and pulled it out to show him. That is when she started, I guess, pushing the gun against his door to get the gun away from him as he was trying to open the door. So it seems like he was trying to open the door to get out and she was like using the gun, pushing it against the door to keep him inside of the car. I feel like I can't picture exactly how that happened based on how Hannah described it, but I imagine there was some sort of just struggle against him opening the door and her trying to keep him in the car even though she was yelling at him to get out of the car. But either way, as that was happening, Hannah was still on the phone with 911. During that, all we hear is a commotion going on and rustling sounds before Hannah jumps back on the call. That is when Hannah, sounding frantic and panicked, told the dispatcher that Kenneth grabbed her and tried to get the gun away from her. But as he grabbed her gun, he pulled the trigger with the gun in her hand and the gun went off and Kenneth was shot. Of course, the dispatcher told her again that she wasn't supposed to follow him, but now it was too late. I actually called about 20 minutes ago for an accident, and no one has shown up yet, um, but I am under the impression that the guy that caused the accident, who ran the red light, is drunk, and that he stopped me back in his car, and he was trying to get away from me, and I don't know if he was trying to get away from me, but I don't know if he was trying to get away from me. Okay, can you get his tag number? Okay, ma'am. 
<laughs> There's a police officer here now. Okay. Speak with them. All right. In that 911 call, you can hear as the dispatcher gets so frustrated with Hannah during this entire thing. It's not, like, funny, but it's kind of funny how the dispatcher says multiple times, ma'am, stop following him, we told you not to follow him, and all of that, and at the end of the call, she's like, okay, talk to them, and I can tell that she is very fed up with Hannah, and that she's like, all right, I'm done with this call, I'm happy it's over, the police can deal with her now, I am so done with this. So, the story I just told, of course, is from Hannah's point of view, she witnessed this man run a red light, leave the scene, and she just wanted to make sure that he wasn't going to cause another accident because she was under the impression that he was drunk. Then she went up to confront him, things got out of control, and the gun went off. However, as all of that was happening, there were witnesses who saw the entire thing. One witness also called 911, and she described something completely different than what Hannah said. According to this witness, she saw Hannah drive up to Kenneth, immediately get out of her car, and charge towards him aggressively, and started yelling and screaming at him right off the bat. Hannah then reached into Kenneth's car and started punching him, all while Kenneth was confused and had no idea what was going on, before Hannah suddenly and without warning pulled out her gun and shot Kenneth two times. Hello? Hello? Hi! Hi, I'm sorry. I'm on the, um, the intersection of, of Phoenix Boulevard and Riverdale right before the um, highway. And this woman, it was a merging lane, and then she, like, got impatient and went around him for no reason because it was coming, coming traffic. And then um, he almost hit her because she did that, so he breaks suddenly. But then she got mad and hopped out her car, and then she pulled out her gun and started screaming at him. And he was like, what the heck? And then she was like, I was just doing And she started hitting him. Yes. Okay, and where are you guys? Um, we're right by the exit of 285 West and 285 North. And it's, um, it's like Phoenix Boulevard goes one okay, way. Okay, yeah, I have somebody on the line for this. Okay, ma'am. Okay, thank you. By the time officers arrived to the scene, obviously, things were chaotic. According to responding officers, Hannah did have a ripped shirt on, there were scratch marks on her chest and arms, as well as a small red mark above her eye and above her lip. On police body cam footage, you can see Hannah immediately handing over her gun to an officer before they question her about what happened. <laughs> After arriving to the scene, Kenneth was rushed to the closest hospital for treatment to see if his life could be spared, but unfortunately, only 20 minutes after arriving to the hospital, Kenneth Herring was pronounced dead after being shot in the torso multiple times. After this, of course, Hannah was taken into the station for questioning. Once again, she just described the whole situation that we just discussed how the whole hit and run happened, she followed him and confronted him. She talked about how when she approached his window, he started grabbing at her and hitting her before she grabbed her gun and warned him that she was going to shoot him if he didn't stop. 
She talked about how he tried getting out of the car and she was afraid for her life when the struggle was happening. She was adamant that Kenneth was the one who grabbed the gun and that he was the one who pulled the trigger. She maintained that she never touched that trigger. And that's when I, I had this, back, this my phone in my hand and I told him, I was like, you need to stop and I'm right there by the by his door at this point. Um, he reaches out and kind of like hit my phone out and grabbed my wrist. Okay. When he grabbed my wrist, um, we kind of started going back and forth, fighting. Um, and that's when he punched the gas and he ran into my tire. Um, he's pulling at it and pulling at it. And that's when I told him, after he reached it, I told him, I said, I have done. I said, I will shoot you. Okay. Um, and that's when I rushed for it. And because I hadn't reached for it, I hadn't touched for it the entire time. I reached for it, I pulled it out, um, and that's when he pulled, it, when I pulled away from him is when, because my shirt ripped. It's not that he let go. Um, he, I had it out at that point. He was still coming at me, still yelling at me, I got something for you, you know, you're shoot me, then shoot me, do it, do it, do it. And he went forward on the door and I pushed it forward with my knee, went back forward, pushed it forward, thinking he was trying to get out, and I told him no. So, did the door open at all, or did it not open? I see, he was pushing at it. Like, he, he rushed down, he went like this. <clears throat> okay. And so that's when I I pushed the door forward, and he grabbed my hand, and we were going back and forth. I didn't have my hand on the trigger, but we were going back and forth, and he was holding it, and he was twisting it, and then that's when I actually got my grip on it. And he was turning it, and it got faced almost all the way around, when I pulled it back and he launched again, like with one hand on me, and he launched and he swung and he grabbed, like right, right here on the back of my shirt. I don't, I honestly, I don't, I don't know. I don't remember telling myself to pull the trigger. He's reaching and turning and twisting, and as he's turning it, he's you know pulling and we're going back and forth. So of course, I I bought it for protection. Not that I have any intentions on ever trying to use it, but I was, prepared, I was trying to get prepared for whatever I need to be prepared for, thinking I'd be able to pull away and then just go, you know, get away from him, and that's not how it happened. Of course, after this whole crazy situation happened, police still needed to fully investigate the entire situation because they couldn't just go solely based off of what Hannah was saying, and they also couldn't just go based off of what the witnesses were saying. Hannah claimed that she never wanted to shoot Kenneth. She just wanted to stop this dangerous man from driving off and causing another crash. Meanwhile, there were others in this case who thought that Hannah was the aggressor. She followed Kenneth despite being told not to. She blocked his car from driving away, and she was the one who got out of her car and went up to Kenneth. And we have that witness who said that she was being aggressive right off the bat. Now, through police investigation, police were able to speak with additional witnesses who actually saw the shooting. They found four witnesses who all describe Hannah as being aggressive, going up to Kenneth, punching him through the window, and then shooting him. All of these people say that Kenneth looked confused and that Hannah was the one who went up to him and started hurting him unprovoked. Then, like I said earlier, Hannah said that Kenneth was the one who pulled the trigger on the gun. Of course, because of this, police did run a DNA test on the gun to see if that statement could be proven or disproven, but the results were not as conclusive as they had hoped. According to the test results, Hannah's DNA was all over the gun, which is to be expected, and there was male DNA found on the top of the gun, but it could not be confirmed that it was Kenneth's DNA on the gun. So we don't exactly know what was meant by that. Basically, it couldn't be proven either way whether or not Kenneth pulled that trigger. So because it was only male DNA and it wasn't 100% confirmed to be Kenneth's DNA, this DNA could have come from any male. It could have been a boyfriend, a friend of Hannah's. It could have been pretty much anybody. So it definitely was not enough to say that Kenneth touched that gun at any point. 
I will note that Kenneth again was shot multiple times, so while it's still possible that he pulled the trigger on himself multiple times, accidentally, in quick succession, in the heat of the moment, the fact that he was shot multiple times does sort of make me question that. When Kenneth's body was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy, they determined that the bullet that shot Kenneth entered from the right at a downward angle. That could mean that Hannah pointed the gun down at him and shot him, but it also could support the argument that Kenneth grabbed the top of that gun and then pointed it down towards him and that the gun went off and shot him in the abdomen. I do also want to say that if this was a struggle and Kenneth was grabbing at the gun, Hannah could have accidentally pulled the trigger and not even realized it. She could have been very confident, very adamant that Kenneth was the one who pulled the trigger because she genuinely did not feel her finger pulling the trigger. I'm not exactly sure what type of gun this was, but most guns don't require a lot of pressure for that trigger to be pulled. So it's absolutely possible that as she was pointing the gun at him to get him to stop attacking her or whatever, he grabbed the gun, pulled it down, and it went off in her hand. That could also be possible. And again, she could totally just not even realize that she was the one that pulled the trigger. There was also a toxicology screen run and it did come back negative for drugs and alcohol. So this truly did seem like something that resulted from a medical event. According to Kenneth's family, they believed that Kenneth was experiencing a diabetes-related event. They said that on May 7th, 2019, Kenneth was actually driving himself to the hospital for his diabetes-related symptoms when he experienced diabetic shock, causing him to pass out and cause that accident and causing the confusion and disorientation that resulted after. He was only a few miles away from the hospital when the crash happened, so this means that Kenneth didn't cause an accident because he was drunk. He didn't cause it because he was on his phone and wasn't paying attention. He was genuinely in the middle of a health crisis and genuinely did not know what was going on. So after talking to witnesses about what happened and collecting their evidence along the way, Police felt like they had enough to charge Hannah with several counts, including felony murder, false imprisonment, and aggravated assault. And after taking this case in front of a grand jury, they felt like there was enough here to take Hannah to trial on these charges. At her bail hearing, she was granted a bail of $100,000 and was required to wear an ankle monitor and follow a 9 p.m. curfew. Now, because this happened back in 2019, right before the COVID pandemic, things were delayed time and time and time again. Things were delayed for four years until finally, in December of 2023, the trial for murder started. The prosecution argued that after witnessing the crash and Kenneth leaving the scene, Hannah felt like she had to take things into her own hands. She was angry and despite being told not to pursue Kenneth several times, she did it anyways. Then, according to witnesses, she drove up to Kenneth, blocked his car in, and charged at him aggressively. According to witnesses, she was the one who started the altercation, punching Kenneth repeatedly while he was just confused and had no idea why he was attacking her before she pulled out her gun. They said that in the state of Georgia, even if Hannah was attempting a citizen's arrest, it does not apply in this situation. You can only make a citizen's arrest if you witness a felony. The crash that Hannah witnessed was only a misdemeanor traffic offense. They said that a traffic violation does not constitute Hannah deciding on a death sentence for Kenneth. There were actually some witnesses who took a video of the altercation on their cell phones. Now, I do want to say that videos of situations like this do not always show the full extent of what happened. Oftentimes, an altercation will start and people are only able to record once things have already started. So, for example, if someone came up to me and punched me, someone might see that and pull their phone out and start recording what happens next. On the video, it might only capture me hitting that person back. 
But according to everybody who views that video, it might look like I was the one who started an altercation out of absolutely nowhere. And then without full context, the social media mobs come to the attack based on a snippet of a video that they witnessed. I'm not saying that is what happened here, but just for anybody who believes everything they see on social media, even if it is in a video, in general, this is something to keep in mind. Context always matters. So with that being said, I will say that at no point in the video do we see Kenneth grabbing Hannah, pulling her towards the car, or attacking her in any way. We can't really see her left hand in the video because it is being blocked by her body, but witnesses say that she was using her left hand to throw the hits at Kenneth. In her right hand, you can see her holding the gun. Then you see the gun go inside of the car just before it goes off. However, again, you cannot see who pulled the trigger. Of course, with this video, we can see that Hannah is confronting Kenneth and she did pull a gun on him. But I don't think we have enough context to point to that video and confidently say that Kenneth was grabbing at Hannah or that Hannah pulled the trigger or that either one was the aggressor. You really can't say either way just based on that video. Again, we do have the witnesses, but if we only saw that video, and again, that's really the only like concrete proof we have here, we need more context to see exactly what happened. If someone had a dash cam and it recorded the entire thing, that would have been great. But again, people only started pulling out their phones once this altercation happened. So we don't see Hannah charging at the car. We don't see, you know, him grabbing at her or knocking the phone out of her hand. We don't see any of that. The defense argued that Hannah was just trying to execute a citizen's arrest to prevent another crash from happening. And in the midst of it, she shot Kenneth in self-defense. They said that she was initially confused at what to do after the crash happened and when Kenneth left the original scene. She said that she was told by Terry, who she believed was a police officer, to get the tag info from Kenneth's car. She said that the dispatch also told her to get that tag information from his plate, so she took that as them telling her to follow him. Once she was told not to follow him, she decided to pursue anyways because she didn't want another crash to happen. They said that Hannah was young when this happened. She was only 21 years old. She knows now that you should never approach someone's car when they're trying to flee the scene of an accident because you can get hurt. But at the time, Hannah didn't know any better. She was just trying to do good. They said that she did not act with malice. There was no reason for her to want to go out of her way and kill some man that she had never met. They said that Hannah went up to Kenneth to give him her phone to talk to the police himself on her phone and tried to prevent him from leaving, but things got out of hand. They said that as soon as she was trying to give Kenneth her phone, he smacked it out of her hand and that's when he started grabbing at her. They said that Kenneth was just as much of the aggressor as Hannah was. So again, they're basically saying that Hannah didn't approach Kenneth to hit him or to confront him and yell at him. She approached him to hand him her phone so that he could speak with the dispatcher who was on the other line. But instead of talking on the phone with the dispatcher, Kenneth grabbed Hannah, ripped her shirt, and caused multiple injuries such as scratches to her chest, neck, back, and arms. They said that she also had abrasions on her lip and her eye, all which indicated that he was just as much involved in the altercation as Hannah was. Then, they also argued that Kenneth had a large knife in the front passenger seat of his car, and according to the defense, during the altercation, Kenneth said, I've got something for you, bitch. It was in that moment that Hannah feared for her life, causing her to pull out her gun to protect herself. But when Kenneth tried grabbing the gun from her, he accidentally shot himself in the abdomen more than once. Then, after the shot went off, she immediately told the dispatcher that Kenneth shot himself. She didn't try to hide it. She didn't try to delay help. She didn't try to run away from the scene. She asked for help immediately. 
they said that this showed that she did not want Kenneth to die. Hannah did take the stand in her own defense at her trial and continued to argue that she only shot Kenneth in self-defense after he started attacking her while she was just trying to do the right thing. On cross-examination, it was said that this entire thing could have been avoided if she didn't introduce a gun into the scenario and Hannah defended herself, saying that she produced the gun to save her own life. When it comes to the injuries that Hannah had, there were a few things that were argued. Of course, the defense said that this is proof that Kenneth physically grabbed her. Others say that these marks weren't all that severe, that they were really just tiny little red marks, and they could have been there before this even took place. In my opinion, even if these marks were caused from the altercation, it doesn't necessarily mean that Kenneth was the attacker or the aggressor. In my opinion, these marks don't mean a whole lot because if Hannah was threatening Kenneth and punching him, he had every right to fight back and try to get her off of him. That could have been what caused those marks. So even if they were from that altercation, it doesn't necessarily mean that Kenneth attacked her. Throughout the trial, the prosecution and defense talked about everything that we've discussed this far. The witnesses, the 911 call, the video, the DNA, the angle of the bullet, and all of that. I do want to note that according to Kenneth's loved ones, Hannah showed no remorse for the shooting at any point during the trial. She only became upset when facing consequences for her own actions. Overall, it was argued that this entire event was avoidable. Hannah did not have to pursue Kenneth. In fact, she was explicitly instructed not to. Yet, she did anyways, and because of that, a man who was loved by many lost his life. After hearing both sides, the prosecution and defense made their closing arguments and the jury was sent off for deliberations. And surprisingly, the jury only took two hours to deliberate before they came back with their verdict. The jury found that Hannah Payne was guilty on all counts, including malice murder, felony murder, false imprisonment, using a firearm in the commission of a felony, and aggravated assault. Okay, the court has been informed that the jury has arrived at a verdict, and so I'm going to bring them in at this time. Bailiff Innes, please. So in the case State versus Hannah Rivnea Payne, case number 2019-CR01737, court has been informed that you have reached a verdict. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am, we have. Mr. Foreperson, if you would go ahead and read the verdict. With regard to count one, as to the offense of malice murder, we, the jury, find the defendant guilty. With regard to count two, as to the offense of felony murder, we found, we the jury find the defendant guilty. With regard to count three, as to the offense of aggravated assault, we the jury find the defendant guilty. With regard to count four, as the offense of felony murder, we find the, we the jury find the defendant guilty. At the sentencing hearing, Kenneth's family asked for the harshest punishment. His family believed this entire time that race played a big role in the murder. They believed that Hannah saw a black man who was suffering from a serious medical episode and immediately assumed that he was drunk and violent. Of course, I do want to note that if someone does not have any sort of medical background, you might not know the difference between someone who is having a medical episode like that and someone who is drunk. I don't really think that matters here, but many have said that Hannah's reaction to this event points to a larger issue 
which is that Hannah saw an unarmed black man, assumed he was more dangerous than he was because of his race, and things escalated because of her implicit bias. Of course, supporters of Hannah said that she is not racist, that race did not play a part in this, but in my opinion, it can't really be said either way. I don't want to accuse her of racism here if that truly was not a part of this, but I also can't say that race doesn't play a part in this. I'm white, and while I do have the right to say my opinion, I've never experienced the type of racism that Black people deal with every single day of their lives, so it's not really my place to say whether or not I think race played a part in this. It might have, it might have just been a subconscious thing in the back of Hannah's mind that that's how she reacted that way without even realizing it, but at the end of the day, I'm not gonna say either way because I don't really think it's my place. Either way, after the trial and hearing impact statements from the family and friends of Kenneth, the judge came to her decision regarding Hannah's punishment. For her charges, Hannah was given a sentence of life in prison with the possibility of parole. Okay, this court has sat through the trial, has heard arguments of defense and the state, has listened to the witnesses today, and after considering all of those things, the court will impose sentence as follows. Please stand, Ms. Lee. With respect to count one, malice murder, the court will impose a sentence of life with the possibility of parole. With respect to count two, felony murder, that will merge into count one and is dismissed as a matter of law. With respect to count three, aggravated assault, that merges into counts one and two. With respect to count four, felony murder, that merges into count one and it is dismissed as a matter of law. With respect to count five, the false imprisonment uh, verdict, the court imposes a sentence of eight years consecutive. With respect to count six, possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony, the court imposes a sentence of five years that will run consecutive. So the court's total sentence is life with the possibility of parole plus eight years consecutive on the false imprisonment and five years consecutive on the possession of firearm during the commission of a felony. Only that at this time, we are at peace right now. The jury did what they were supposed to do. They heard all of the evidence. They saw all of the evidence and they came back with a swift verdict and when I heard the first verdict, I know it wasn't supposed to show sign, but tears start rolling down my face because at that moment, I felt a relief that came over. And from the first to the second to the, all the way to the eighth, all I could say was thank you, thank you, thank you. Of course, this sentence can't bring Kenneth back to his family, but it can give them a little bit of peace knowing that the person responsible for his death is behind bars and will be most likely for the majority of her life. Now, after hearing this case, I know that you guys are going to have so many differing opinions. I was truly shocked when I heard how quickly the jury came back with their decision because I think this is a really tough case. I think it's obvious that Hannah is responsible for Kenneth's death. She was the one who chose to follow and confront Kenneth when she was explicitly told not to. She was the one who brought a gun to the scene. Whether she was feeling afraid or not, she is the one who produced the entire situation. In my opinion, I do think that Hannah shot Kenneth. I think that she thought he was drunk, she witnessed this accident, and when he left, she was pissed. She wanted him to take accountability. And I get this 100%. I'm someone who takes drunk driving and driving under the influence very seriously. 
I cannot stand people who drive recklessly and choose to put other people's lives in danger for such selfish reasons. This might be a little bit controversial, but even if you do have a medical condition and you've been told by a doctor not to drive or if you feel woozy or lightheaded or anything, you should not be driving no matter what, and if you do, that is still a selfish decision. I don't blame Hannah for thinking that Kenneth was drunk. I don't think that should have been emphasized as much as it was in terms of her guilt because she's not a medical professional and there's no way that she could have known. However, even if he was drunk or under the influence, the reaction that Hannah had was not necessary. I do think that she had road rage. I think that this is the simplest explanation here. I think she got really angry when he drove away from the scene and she wanted to follow him and confront him to make sure that he couldn't just, you know, escape the scene and avoid accountability. I think that when she confronted him, things got out of control and I do think she shot him. I don't think he pulled the trigger and I do believe that there could have been an altercation and he might have tried to grab the gun. But regardless, I do think it was her finger that pulled the trigger. I think these witnesses are accurate in saying that she probably charged at him aggressively, which would confirm that this was more of a road rage incident than of her just defending herself because he grabbed at her. Because again, she went up to him. She may have made him feel like his life was in danger because this crazy woman just came and blocked your car in and is charging at you and you're confused. You don't know what happened. You don't know why this person is charging at you like that. He might have grabbed her. He might have tried hitting her to get her away from him. But that doesn't really matter to me because she's the one who charged at him and I think that makes her the aggressor in this case. This is not the first case of road rage shootings and it definitely will not be the last. I do think that it's absolutely ridiculous that people allow themselves to get this upset but we have all heard of people being cut off or riding their asses or driving too slowly and someone walks up to the other car with a gun or a bat or a crowbar or something like that. It's insane and it happens more than I would like to think, but either way, I think that is what happened here. But with that being said, I think she should have been charged with something like second degree murder instead. I do think these charges were a little bit harsh because I don't necessarily know if I think she went up to his car with the intention of shooting him. I don't think that can be proven. I do think that things got out of control and she shot him more so out of a heat of the moment type of thing. So I don't know if I agree with the charges that she had, but that's what the justice system said, so that's what she's dealing with right now. But that is why I wanted to cover this case because it is such a wild one and I know that everybody is going to have their own opinions, so that is all of the information that I have for today's case and now I want to know what you all think about it. What do you think happened here? Do you think that Hannah shot Kenneth or do you believe her account? Do you agree with her charges and sentence or do you think it's too harsh? Let's discuss any thoughts that you have on this case down below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!